Good morning. Once again, we want to welcome everybody here. We appreciate everybody's presence so much and uh, invite you to follow along with me in your Bibles as we go through this lesson. We're kind of doing an old-fashioned lesson today on baptism. I uh, know how we kind of get away from the basics sometimes. Uh, we like to hear new things and look at new things. And I know preachers like to do that too, and I always like to do that. But uh, I'm uh, resolved this year to go back to some basic lessons because one of the things I've been impressed with uh, recently is uh, the Christians who have been sitting in churches for years and how little they know. And I think a lot of this has to do with their attitude, of course. I think we need to be specially uh, uh, advised, do what we can to uh, preach them and continue to preach the basics so that people understand where we're coming from. You'll see a lot of Bible verses in this lesson, as you always do when uh, people get in the pulpit up here. And uh, follow along with me. The reason why we read Bible verses, we believe those passages are inspired by God. They're not of men. They're not men making up rules for us to follow. What we're doing is following the Word of God, and that's what we try to do. So everything we say, we want to back up with book, chapter, verse, as we say. So once again, welcome everybody, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, bring another lesson to you and I'll try to keep that up from time to time as long as you'll let me and uh, we'll begin the day in Ephesians and we're going to talk about a one the one baptism that we all have I don't know of anything that gets more distorted in the religious world and then baptism and I have my own theories of why it gets so distorted uh, I was raised a Lutheran, and I was baptized as a baby in a long white gown. And I have pictures of it, <laughs> if any of you want to see it. And we had the preacher and the, the uh, what they call them, godparents uh, beside him, beside me. And it was quite a scene. And everybody was very happy because little Ricky got baptized. But you know, as I got older, all I did was get wet on top of my head. And uh, that was it. And I think uh, one of the reasons why that I've, the people baptize babies is because parents are so concerned with their children. Isn't that one of your greatest fears is that your children will go astray? So they decided, let's take care of that. Let's make them Christians right off the bat. Well, it doesn't work like that. The Bible tells you, as we'll go through this lesson today, has a lot to do with that person deciding to be a Christian. It has a lot to do with that person calling on the name of Jesus. So those things are all very important, and that doesn't happen until you get old enough to understand uh, uh, what baptism is. So hopefully we can make some advance on that idea of baptism, and uh, we'll start in Ephesians chapter 4. There uh, we're going to read uh, verse 5. Let's start in verse 3. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So there's a whole sermon right there in that one lesson. But we're just going to pick out one part of it, the one baptism, but all that kind of comes together, doesn't it? When we talk about the one hope and the one faith, there's no uh, bunch of different faces. Faith. There's only one faith, and it's found in the Bible, and that's what we're going to study about. And this one baptism that comes from God our Father. We first, we first begin talking about the one authority of baptism and why we do it. And, of course, the one authority we have on baptism is that Christ commanded baptism. We'll begin in Mark uh, 16 and verse 16. You see, I started uh, just a little sideline. I had a friend of mine who follows uh, these lessons very well, and he commented that uh, I need to put print more Bible verses. So I'm going to do that and see. Uh, do you tell me what you think about it? He says uh, a lot of the old guys don't like looking up the verses, is what he told me. <laughs> so we'll try this and see how it works for you. I like it because whenever I say something, you can see it on the board and uh, tell me uh, if, it's, uh, if it's right or not. And uh, also notice one thing, 
Our screen is fading, and our computer is fading, too, so uh, that tells me both those things need to be updated. Let's go back to our lesson. One authority on baptism, Christ commanded baptism. Very familiar verses for us in Mark 16 and verse 16. And uh, there it says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. That's pretty plain, isn't it? Then it continues, but he who does not believe will be condemned. It tells us how this belief is something we, we have to have a part of it. Another familiar verse that you see quite a bit is in Acts chapter 2. They're reading in verse 38. Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There we see uh, uh, Paul, I mean Peter in his uh, first, uh, one of his first gospel uh, uh, lessons here. And this crowd responding so well to the gospel as it presented to them. You can almost hear him exclaiming to them they need to turn from their ways and repent. And tells them to be baptized. And uh, they had quite a success there in Acts chapter 2 with those uh, Jews especially being baptized, becoming Christian. So we have one authority for baptism in Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 10 and verse 48 tells us that he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And they asked him to stay a few more days. So this was at Cornelius' house in uh, Acts uh, chapter 10 where they got to preach the gospel again and had a great response to the good news presented to them. And, uh, and they too wanted to be baptized in the name of the Lord, the one authority that we have there. And they asked them to stick around for a while also. Then we have in uh, Acts chapter 19, uh, uh, we have a, a, a story there for us about uh, baptism. And uh, I want to read the first few verses there in Acts 19. There we're going to begin in verse 1. The Bible reads for us there, When Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found uh, some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul then asked them, Then what baptism did you receive? They said, John's baptism. They replied, Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the same name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. They spoke in tongues and prophesied. They were all about 12 men in all. So we see that the one authority even came true in the first century in which uh, Paul had to get things kind of straightened out with them with John the Baptist and told them they needed to be baptized in Jesus Christ's name. Of course, we have that same command for us today. We need to follow Jesus and become baptized as he commanded us to do. So again, we have one authority for the baptism that we have before us here that we're going to talk about. Also, baptism is for one person, and that would be the penitent believer. I'm not saying baptism isn't for everyone, but I'm saying that if you're going to be baptized, you need to be a penitent believer. That's one thing that we have against, uh, that uh, the Bible has against uh, infant baptism. I've talked to several people, and some of these are uh, uh, raised in Christian families, and they have told me before that they were pressured into being baptized. Some of them almost act like their dad dragged them to the front and almost threw them in the water. And they've asked me about that. You think that was right? I said, no, it wasn't. You were just getting wet. You had to be a penitent believer. You had to be somebody that turned your life around, decided to dedicate it to Christ. Your parents can't do that for you. You have to do that for yourself. So they were quite, uh, they were kind of stressed out by it, but also quite relieved that they had some answers to it. So baptism is for those who believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Those who believe in the one God and Creator. Mark 16 and verse 16 tells us again, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. 
If we go to Mark chapter 28, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 28, there in verse 18, we have that great commission in which Jesus was about to ascend into heaven. There with his disciples and believers on that hill, he gave them some commands before he left, important commands. There Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's what Christ wanted us to do. That's what Christ wanted those disciples on the hill to do also. And he also pointed out the fact that he has all authority. Going on in Acts chapter 18, they're reading in verse 8, Then Christmas, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord and with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. These people heard the gospel message. That's what turned them around. Dynamic preachers didn't turn them around. People with uh, great uh, uh, choirs behind them and uh, stained glass hadn't turned them around. They turned them around by hearing the word of God. That's what's so important. Also in Acts, now reading in chapter 8, verse 35, remember this story about Philip and the eunuch traveling along? And then verse uh, 35, it reads, Then Philip began... With that very passage, the eunuch was reading in the scripture, Old Testament, and told him the good news about Jesus. That's how that eunuch turned himself around. He understood the good news that was before him. Baptism is only for those who believe in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Baptism is also for those who repent. Remember Acts 2 and verse 38 again, repent and be baptized. Then we have in Romans chapter 6, some good verses to mark down and remember, <clears throat> talking about baptism and conversion to Christ and uh, repentance. What shall we say then, the Bible reads? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we, who died to sin, live any longer in it? Or do you know not or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we who are also should walk in newness and life. See that connection that he has that he's putting for us in the Bible. How baptism is connected with this penitent believer. How turning our lives around, how we're putting to death the sinful thoughts and the sinful actions of our past life. And how we are with Christ now uh, uh, in newness of life, the New Testament tells us. So baptism, as we see, is for one kind of person. A person who is a penitent believer. One who believes in Christ Jesus has resolved to do away with the sin in his life. Also, we know that baptism is for one purpose. That's for the remission of sins. There we're going to start reading in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, there in verse 21, God's purpose with baptism is to save us. There, 1 Peter is written, there is also an antitype which now saves us. So antitype. We had a preacher here that uh, loved to talk about antitypes. And I did too, because he kind of turned me on to this new concept in the New Testament. Well, these are shadows or approximations that uh, point us in a direction here. So baptism is considered an antitype here in the New Testament. There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of filth of the, of the flesh, but the answer of good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So they had to spell that out in the first century. And I'll kind of talk about this and we'll hit it again later. But when they said baptism, most people thought of just something getting dunked in water. They thought of immersion when they heard baptism. So here uh, in 1 Peter, they're describing, no, it's not just the washing. 
It's the washing away of your sins. It's the, it's the answer of a good conscience toward God. It's talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 3. Again in Mark 16, there in verse 16, he who is baptized is saved. Uh, uh, talks again about the remission of sins and how that helps us get us on the right path in this uh, life as a Christian. Finally, about this idea of uh, purpose to save, I wanted to go to Galatians uh, chapter 3. And there we start reading in verse 26. For you all are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. So that's quite a monumental thing, isn't it? When you rise yourself out of the Bible, out of the baptism, baptismal waters, you see that you're also, as that water washes off of you, you see that also you have put on Christ. That's something you need to understand that you're doing. Something you need to believe in also. The putting on of Christ. You're going to change your life. You're a new Christian. You want to do better. That's one of the pur- That's the purpose of this baptism in Christ Jesus. Also, we have one element. Some of this might seem kind of basic, but it all needs to be said and talked about. You know, there are, uh, uh, if you've run into people like this before, I'm sure that know just about enough about the Bible to be uh, dangerous, so to speak. And uh, they'll talk about different kinds of baptism in the New Testament. Well, which kind is right, they'll say. We talked about this baptism, that baptism. Well, there are some other baptisms mis- uh, mentioned here. I think that has to do with the fact of our transliteration of the word baptism. We take that baptismo word. Well, they used it for other things in the New Testament. Here in Matthew 3, is the first one I noticed, talked about a baptism of fire. Indeed, baptism you, indeed you with water. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me, this is John speaking, John the Baptist, after me is mightier than I. I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. We saw that in the first century also. We saw the Holy Spirit uh, coming upon those people and giving them some power also. And John the prophet, John the Baptist, uh, predicted these things were going to happen. And people uh, have uh, blown that way out of proportion. Now, something for the first century Christians. Uh, we also have the Holy Spirit, but we're not going to do those miraculous things that those, some of those first century Christians were able to do. Also, we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Mention it there. Also, Acts chapter 1, verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now, I was talking about that day of Pentecost that came upon those uh, first century Christians. Also another various baptism mentioned in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, first couple of verses there. <clears throat> I'm sorry, yeah, 1 Corinthians 10, first verses there. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under a cloud. All passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So those things are all referenced in the New Testament. Uh, but they shouldn't confuse the situation in that we have one baptism that is of the Great Commission. And this is a baptism we're talking about that makes you, helps you become a Christian. In uh, Acts chapter 8, they're reading in verse 36, uh, again uh, to the story of the eunuch, Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. That's the baptism of the great commission isn't it that's what jesus wants us doing today that's what god encourages us to do with the great gospel he's given us encourage people to be baptized for remission of their sins
Also in Acts chapter 10, they're reading in verse 47, Can anyone forbid water that these should be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. They asked him to stay a few more days. So this was all those uh, <coughs> pagans who were not Jews. And here in Acts chapter 10, we can see that they come to the realization they too believed in Jesus Christ. The apostle pointed out that they had even received the Holy Spirit. Those too were baptized. And this one element that we use for baptism, which is water. <clears throat> Talking about baptism, another thing that needs to be clarified is one action. And that is immersion. I've seen some uh, crazy things over the years. I've seen movies in which they've had Jesus standing in a river, but they still pit, cupped up water in their hands and sprinkled it on his head. I've seen uh, uh, all kinds of different things. And I just uh, <laughs> threw away a Lutheran catechism going through some old boxes in which uh, they said you can do it any way you want. Sprinkle, dip. Immersion. And I've even seen uh, Lutheran immersions also. <clears throat> but you can see in the pattern we see in the New Testament, this one action immersion is quite clear. It's not something we can distort or take away. It's something that we need to be uh, uh, careful to do. I had an aunt went to her grave, wouldn't be baptized because she didn't want to mess up her hair. And that's prevalent. You hear that from time to time. It's a humbling thing. To come in here and get dunked in a, in a uh, baptism uh, in front of everybody. You don't have to be in front of everybody. But if you are, it's a kind of a humbling thing. I aunt wouldn't do it. Wouldn't mess up her hair. That's how little she cared for what the Bible said. Well, the Bible pattern we see is that uh, immersion is quite prevalent. There's no other conclusion you can come to. We'll first go to Colossians uh, chapter 2. There the writer tells us about being baptized with Christ Jesus, buried with him in baptism. Verse 12 of Colossians 2, Buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all, trespasses. So this talks about baptism being equivalent to a burial, not a sprinkling of dirt when you bury somebody. They're completely underneath the ground. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, similar type language. Or you not know that as many of us that were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. That also talks about this burial, equivalent to this immersion. And we also notice and throughout the scriptures that uh, baptism required a lot of water. It wasn't just a sprinkling. I think the, the baptistry that uh, I remember in the first church Lutheran church I had probably had about two cups of water in it. And it was all in our ornate carved and uh, had a nice little stainless steel bowl in it. And I remember checking it out when I was a kid. Well, uh, that doesn't quite work for immersion, does it? And, uh, and we have an equivalent, uh, we have a verse that tells us, of course, you remember the eunuch uh, uh, stopping, there's enough water for both of them to get into. But John chapter 3, here in verse 23, now John also was baptized in Anon near Salem because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. John the Baptist was baptizing dozens or hundreds. Doesn't really give us tell how much he did, but uh, he couldn't do that with two cups of water. He needed a river. And they're all gathering at the riverside and getting baptized there. Uh, when I first started attending church here, I... Uh, some of the old guys, a lot of old guys were here when I first started. So this is like 1979, and they talked about people walking down the hill here to the creek. And that's where they got baptized, right down there. There was enough water there that they could kneel down and get enough water to cover everybody. 
Well, so that's how it was done. Getting baptized in these baptistries uh, <coughs> this, these days require a lot of water. So it's one action in baptism, and that's immersion. Talk about baptism, we talk about uh, uh, <coughs> the one action of immersion also continuing. Looking at the Bible pattern here, uh, <coughs> let's turn now to Acts chapter 8 again. And we want to notice here that uh, there's two people involved uh, that were mentioned. I often, uh, many have commented that the eunuch probably wasn't traveling by himself. Uh, <coughs> being a court official, he probably had quite a little troop with him. But uh, here we see uh, he just heard the gospel. Uh, Philip uh, preaching him and uh, uh, telling him how it all connected to the Old Testament. Right here in chapter 8, uh, the eunuch's uh, commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down in the water. He baptized him. There's no other conclusion you come up with is that they were both coming to the water so they could be immersed. Also, uh, not they, so the eunuch could be immersed. And then uh, we want to go to Jesus' baptism, still talking about immersion. In Matthew chapter 3, there in verse 16, uh, uh, so John the Baptist, baptizing Jesus in the river. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. That was talking about Jesus' baptism. No, he wasn't sprinkled. The Bible tells us he was coming out of the water. He was immersed in that river by John the Baptist. That was an example for us. Tell us what we needed to do also. Jesus Christ, God's Son, showing us how to be baptized. As we said earlier, the word baptism is a transliteration. We took a word and we made it uh, literal to English. So the word baptismo means immersion. It says you would immerse a cup to wash it. It would be a mercy person to make him a Christian. And that's why uh, it's kind of confusing to me. I first started hearing about this, how we got things so distorted. I wondered what it was all about. Uh, besides the parents wanting to make sure their babies were Christians, they also had this false concept of original sin involved in which uh, they consider all people are stained with sin until they get baptized. So that's why you even have babies that have passed away, getting baptized in some religious groups. There's terrible distortion of what the New Testament has for us and that uh, people decide to become Christians, decide to be baptized, because that's what the Bible is teaching us. Got more one, one, one more one direction for you, and that is we're baptized into one thing, and that is into one body. <coughs> Bible baptism puts one into the body, into the one body that we're all striving to do in our lives, to be part of the Christian faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, they're reading in verse 13. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Bible baptism puts us into that one body that the New Testament tells us about. Reading in John now, John chapter 3, verse 3 and verse 5, talks about entering into this kingdom of God, this Christian faith. John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus talking in his ministry to those who have come and asked him questions about this idea of being born again. Skipping over to verse 5. Most assuredly I say to, to you, unless one is born of water in the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's how necessary it is. I think some people, some Christian faiths believe it's not all that necessary. The kind of thing you do, maybe. It's not all that important. See right here, <clears throat> Jesus talking about it. 
calls it very important. Cannot enter the kingdom of God without it. Continuing on, <coughs> talk about baptism. <coughs> the Lord adding you to the church. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. And those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. <coughs> Continuing on, that great chapter in Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Praising God. <coughs> this is after the gospel sermon. They were praising God and having favor with all those people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. <coughs> chapter 2 and verse 7. Baptism gets you in that right direction toward God. Also gets you into Christ. As Galatians 3 and verse 27 tells us, <coughs> As for many of you as were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. That's such an important thing for a Christian. That's why we don't want to dismiss it and think like it's not all that important. Because we understand how important it is. It gets you in the one body with Christ. Get you baptized and get you living your life as a Christian. Well, I'm going to land in a little early today. <coughs> I wanted to talk about this one baptism that we have before us in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 and 6. And here the great writer has for us these great words that we get a lot of lessons off of here in just a couple verses. There's one body and one spirit. Just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Well, I hope you found this lesson on baptism something good to hear. I hope uh, you can use this lesson to tell others in their faith, about their travels and their faith about baptism and how important it is. <clears throat> the world has pretty much dismissed this idea of baptism. You can see by reading the New Testament, it's central to our faith. It's an important part in your Christian growth and something you need to be very aware of and be able to tell others about it. Because people will ask you about it. They'll ask you about baptism. It seems a pretty radical idea to many. Well, we want you to look at yourself this morning See where you're at. <clears throat> if you have yet to call Jesus Christ your Savior, if you've yet to be joined with him in baptism, but you hear the call of the gospel to do that, we'd like you to come forward today. Or if you've lived your life in such a way that you haven't quite got yourself right with Christ, and you want to turn yourself around, you like the prayers and the help of the congregation here, we too would be happy to help with you, help you, and pray for you also. Whatever your need might be, we ask you to come forward as together we stand and sing.